for coming here to the last session of the day with Mr. Lev L. Spiro, team director, uh, award-winning director, and everything. So we got some cool questions from your side. We're going to be asking you. And hopefully, you will get to learn more about the you know, office, about the job as a TV director. So if you're good, we're good to start. First of all, uh, I understand uh, you have a degree in politics. Uh, you know, it makes me wonder, do you always wanted to be a TV director? I, I have a, a bachelor's degree in political science. Uh, and then I, I stayed in, in school to avoid reality for another couple of years and I got a double major in uh, so political science and communication arts. And I got into filmmaking pretty late in college and then went to graduate school and studied uh, uh, film directing. But I still, like, I still like, uh, I didn't get to do very much with politics, but I like trying to insult Republicans. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I try. It's hard. Uh, so I know, no, I think you have an experience actually as a movie director, but you have mostly, mostly done TV. Uh, do you then consider yourself a TV, a TV director who tends to dive into filmmaking from time to time, or the other way around? Well, I, I, I'm sorry, uh, it's a little bit hard to hear you, but I think you're asking me if I consider myself a TV director that got into filmmaking or the other way around, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't come out to Los Angeles to be a, a TV director, quote unquote. Um, I came, but you know, what I love doing is directing actors and making films and all of the television that I do is what we call single camera. Yeah. Uh, it's either like one hour drama or half hour single camera comedy. Yeah. So it's all filmmaking. I mean, it's it's really making, if I'm making an episode of Orange is the New Black or Modern Family or Arrested Development, I'm making a 43 minute or a 23 minute uh, film. Either, yeah. you know, so either a dramatic film or a comedic <laughs> film. Um, I know I came out here and I, I got my break um, making movies mm -hmm. with a guy named Roger Corman. Uh, who is kind of the king of B-movies, he's still around. Uh, it's not making so many films these days, but I got started with Roger, and the first movie that I made for him was a comedy, and I was with an agency at the time, and they saw this and said, wait a second, gosh, you're really good with comedy. Uh, you know, they, they had hired me on the strength of my student thesis film from graduate school, which is a very dramatic film about a, uh, a black, uh, sorry, a white farmer in Texas in the early 60s, who shelters a black uh, fugitive on his farm because he thinks he's been wrongly uh, convicted. Um, and it's based on a, a short story by James Lee Burke and uh, that was very well received. But anyway, so they hadn't seen me do comedy and, they, and they, they saw this comedy film I had made, which was called Welcome to Planet Earth or came out under the title Alien Avengers also with George Wendt and Shanna Reed. And this woman said, you're so good with comedy. Have you ever thought about directing television? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I like directing, so you know, get me a meeting and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and I became so successful at directing television that it kind of eclipsed my film career uh, because I was doing all these network shows. And when you're working 10 months out of the year, 11 months out of the year, you don't have time to make movies. Yeah. Ironically, when I went back and started making movies again, it really hurt my TV career because I was gone from the TV season for years at a time. So, you know, I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. And I, I cause yeah, I love yeah. doing both. Um, I love doing uh, episodic television and I love doing pilots and features. Cool. Well, well speaking of, uh, you know, the movies, uh, uh, you know, what would you say is the difference now that you work both? Uh, what would you say is the difference between uh, you know, we said the format and the deadline between movies and team direction. Sure, I'll answer that. Hey, can I ask you a question? I see at the bottom of the screen it says zero viewers. Is this just a conversation between you and me right now? Uh, no, well, the internet comes uh, from time to time. Okay, uh, well, so but are you going to post this somewhere? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's posted on social media and stuff. So. Not that I mind talking to you. You're a very charming guy. So okay, the difference between, yeah, there's a very big difference between directing um, pilots and features on the one hand and directing episodic television on the one hand. So when I'm doing episodes, I'm not there to make 
a Lev L. Spiro film necessarily. I'm there to realize the vision of the showrunner. So for Orange is the New Black and Weeds, that's Genji Cohen. She's the one that created the show. She, uh, you know, every word, every script goes through her computer. Um, so in television, you have very powerful showrunners, which is why, frankly, TV produces so many great hours of drama because you have a singular voice. You know, my wife has created and is running a show called Jessica Jones on Netflix, and she's a wonderful writer, and it's a fantastic show because there's not a word written on that show that doesn't go through her computer. So as a director, I'm coming on trying to help realize somebody else's vision. And um, I'm bringing what I can to the table. I'm, and sometimes, you know, it depends. If it's in the first season of a show, I can have a very big impact on the look and feel of a show. If it's in the fourth season of a show, they've really already kind of found their rhythm. Uh, the actors know what the, the, the characters are. The cinematographer knows exactly what the lighting is and they, they really have things more set. So you can push, you know, in little ways, um, but it's not quite the same. I did a show called Everybody Hates Chris, mm -hmm. where I was the first director on after the pilot director and a uh, very talented guy named Reginald Hudlin had directed this brilliant pilot and done a fantastic job bringing these characters to life. He shot it in a very different way than I shot the first episode. He shot it, yeah. it looked very much like a feature um, he used kind of long lenses, the camera was a little bit more static, and he did an, an amazing job with it. I, when they showed me the first script after the pilot, it had all these flash forwards and flashbacks and, and uh, flights of fantasy. And I talked to the showrunners, uh, Howard Gewertz and Ali Leroy, and I said, you know, I could see this having a much looser style uh, with a lot more camera movement and a lot more interesting camera angles and um, not more interesting, but, but different, more varied. So, and I said, look, if you hate it, you know, I'm going to show you all my shots ahead of time and just tell me, you know, that you don't like it and I'll, I'll go back to exactly what you did in the pilot. But they really liked it. So that kind of became the new template for the show with these characters that Reginald had helped create. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have a very big impact on a TV series if you come in very early. Um, you know, I came on the fourth season of Dawson's Creek. 12 <laughs> and they had things very set and you know the showrunner said to me look we don't really like too much camera movement it's okay if you pan the guys in but we like them to sit and talk to each other it's like you know okay fine um but again my job is to realize the showrunner's vision um and i i bring as much of myself to that as i can it's very different with pilots and features as you're really a filmmaker you're one of the authors of the work you're helping create the entire world you have to figure out what does this world look like? What is the style of acting? What is the style of camera work? What is the color palette? What is the music? What is the set design? Everything. So you're starting from scratch, you know? So um, that's why I like doing pilots and features because it really engages me fully as a filmmaker um, in a way that episodic directing doesn't. Now, having said that, some of the most interesting things I've gotten to do were episodic because the writing is so good. You know, it, it's um, shows like Weeds and Arrested Development and Modern Family, uh, the writing is brilliant. So uh, I don't that often get the chance to do writing of that caliber when I'm doing original shows. Um, yeah. I do, you know, I, 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 the pilots that I've picked, I picked because I love the writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to insult any of my writers, pilot writers who are all still very good friends of mine. Uh, and and it is, it's a lot more satisfying for me because I, get to help create those worlds. Yeah, so you know, so speaking of, of mentoring the show, you know, you mentioned you have done some pilots, but when it comes to a show that has already, like you mentioned, it doesn't create and stuff that has already, uh, you know, been for a while, then you enter all kind of in the, the, the middle of the season or something, do you take like, uh, uh, you know, do you try to include your own style into the shows, you, the episodes you, you, you direct, or do you try to have a consistency or something like that? I do. What I what I do is I do a lot of homework. Uh, mm -hmm. I watch a lot of the episodes of the show to see what the the essence of the show is stylistically, um, and then I try to bring my own style to it as well. So you don't want to stray too far from it. You know, it has to still be in the language of the show. But for example, the last show that I did was uh, Orange is the New Black. 
And um, what I saw in a lot of the episodes before mine was a fairly static camera style. And I, I like to move the camera more. Um, I try to do it in very subtle ways that don't call attention to themselves. But um, I did. And you know, of course, a lot of that um, didn't make it into the final cut. You, you see some camera movement about, about <laughs> a third of what I had. But um, I'm really proud of that episode. I think they did. Uh, Genji and the producers, Mark Burley, and the writer, they did a fantastic job uh, finishing uh, uh, my work, our work. So I'm very proud of that episode. But yeah, I did try to bring a little bit more of my style to the show that has already existed uh, three and a half years when I came on to it. So, so kind of following the same question, and well, they asked for a question, but we kind of Per professor, question twist a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, depending on the genre, though, you have mostly done comedies and stuff, but comedies tend to change also in style. Uh, do you take a different approach with this, each project? Uh, well, I've done a lot of both, actually. Um, I used to do a lot more. My, my uh, career was very evenly split between um, drama and comedy earlier on, and I was doing shows like uh, The O.C., Dawson's Creek, Gilmore Girls, Everwood, American Dreams, uh, Popular, One Tree Hill, um, Ugly Betty. Those, some of those have comedy to varying degrees. What happened was I, I was part of this kind of early wave when, uh, when single camera comedy became uh, very popular. Uh, it was because Malcolm in the Middle had been a very successful show, and suddenly all these networks were like, well, wait a second, we're going to do single camera comedy. Yeah. And they, um, there weren't a lot of directors that the executives, the studio and network executives thought could do single camera comedy because comedy directors were traditionally from multi-camera, from four camera comedy, which is a very different style, different medium. And the people that knew how to be filmmakers and make single camera stuff were from the drama side. Yeah. So I found myself in this group of really like 30 or 40 directors. And for five or six years, I always saw the same names on, <laughs> on every director list. It was like the, we were doing all these different shows. Um, so, uh, but you know, part of what I love about directing television is the ability to go between very different styles of shooting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for one year I was doing, uh, I found myself doing Psych, which is a single camera comedy, and I was doing Arrested Development, which is all handheld and kind of faux uh, documentary style. Yes. And then I was doing this show. It didn't last for a long time, but, um, uh, oh, geez, now I got to think of the name of it. It was like, it was a horror show. It'll come to me, sorry. Um, I worked my way through college as a reggae drummer, so my yeah. memory, uh, <laughs> short term memory impairment. Um, it'll come to me. It was a, it was this great kind of horror show that we shot in San Diego and it was on Fox for one year. So, but it was very kind of gothic horror and yeah. anyway, I, I, it's, that's part of the fun of being a TV director is being able to do all these different styles. Um, I just did a show last year called Still the King, which is on yeah. CMT. I'm going to go back and do a bunch more episodes for them. They got picked up for a second season and that was really fun for me because that's, um, they were very much inspired by Cone Brothers, whom I love. I, I try to rip off the Cone Brothers whenever I can. And, um, so, you know, I got to do this fight scene in a bar between 30 Elvis impersonators and 30 Johnny Cash impersonators. And it was just, it was kind of crazy. It's really fun. Um, so yeah, doing different styles is, is part of the fun. Cool. All right. So, uh, like we have mentioned, you have been diving between uh, dramas and comedy. But one thing I've noticed is that most of the shows, especially comedy, tends to have this very unique, sometimes quirky type uh, of style. You know, is that a coincidence, or you have some sort of uh, soft spot for this type of shows? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I'm. Uh, I definitely have a soft touch for for quirky comedy. I mean, I'm kind of a comedy whore. I love all kinds of comedy. I like. I like smart comedy. I like quirky comedy. I like absurdist comedy. I like physical comedy. If people fall down and you know, bonk themselves in the groin. I laugh. So, uh, I bet um, they remade the Three Stooges as a uh, as a movie a couple of years ago, 
And I wasn't expecting very much, and it was brilliant. I think it was the Farrelly brothers who did that. And it was, yeah. the physical comedy was so good, and it's not easy to do. It has to be shot very carefully, and um, they did an amazing job. They, they cast it really brilliantly. I'm still looking for the name of this other show, by the way. That's why you see me looking around on my computer screen. It was called Point Pleasant. That was the horror one. I, I, okay. now, I can, now I can sleep tonight. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to smart, quirky comedies. It's true. Um, but I rarely say no when people offer me work. So I've done, <laughs> I've done, you know, people ask me if they find out I'm a TV director, they say, oh, would I know anything you've done? And yeah, I, I'll reel off the, the 15 shows that I know they're going to be impressed by that they've heard. But there's another 50 shows that nobody's ever heard of because they didn't last so very long, but I've done all of them. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, one of my favorites was a show called Kitchen Confidential that had Bradley Cooper and Bonnie Somerville, and uh, it was an amazing cast. And uh, um, it, you know, Fox had it on for, I think, eight episodes and they yanked it. But yeah, I'm proud of the two episodes I did on that. So I've done lots of work I'm really proud of that nobody's ever seen. Um, yeah, that's one of the saddest thing about TV, you know, there's a lot of drama uh, because there are so many projects that people like tend to, uh, these networks tend to, you know, drop some very good shows and stuff. So, yeah, this is like the saddest thing. Uh, so, you know, uh, does, does this show, you know, speaking of the quirky type of shows, have any sort of particular challenges? Uh, in, in comparison to the in comparison to the dramas that you have done in the past, uh, you know, uh, comedy is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, making successful drama is not easy either. But comedy is harder, frankly, because you make a drama that doesn't quite work. Maybe it's still entertaining. Maybe there's some good, you know, action scenes or something. Even if the story's not working very well, if you make a comedy and it's not funny. It's a failure. It's an abject failure. So comedy either works or it does not work. And you can't really teach comedy. It's like I think you have to grow up uh, in, a, in a screwed up family. That's my theory. People, people are like, well, how did you get into comedy? It's like, oh, fucked up family. My parents were therapists. My father still is a psychiatrist. My mother was a psych psychotherapist. Aunts and uncles, all of them. So. I, I come from a place of great neuroses, and that's where the comedy comes from. Um, also, just to ver you know, there's a lot of a lot of humor in my ancestry. And uh, my father broke a chain of 16 generations of rabbis by becoming a psychiatrist. So, comedy gold right there. Um, <laughs> I did, so that's my first response to your question: Is that, you know, what are the challenges of doing quirky comedy? It's like, well, it's comedy. It's hard. Uh, uh, for me, comedy is very much about rhythm. Uh, part of the reason that I like uh, comedy so much is, I, as I say, I worked my way through college as a drummer, mm -hmm. and um, I love, I mean, I love working with the actors on the set. And one of the other parts that I love is being in the editing room, and and really just fine tuning the timing, so that the the funny parts, you know, there, there's, it's hard to describe, but it's it's very musical. Uh, comedy is all about the rhythm of jokes, of what comes before and the spaces between, yeah. and uh, and the sh and the, the the spaces of the shots that you're showing the audience and how you're directing their attention. Um, so, is quirky comedy more difficult than other kinds of comedy? I don't know. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of comedy. I read a lot of screenplays uh, come to me, and a lot of them are what I call very down the middle of the road, which is to say they're kind of boring. Yeah. It's stuff we've seen a million times. We've seen this romantic comedy, and oh, in the second act, now they're they're chained together, and you know, it's just it's nothing new. The stuff that attracts me is stuff that's very smartly written. It's quirky characters. It's interesting characters. It's the material's more challenging. The farther out you go on a comedy limb, um, the for me, the better the comedy is. Yeah. Um, I love. I mean, the, you know, I was hooked on. I guess I shouldn't admit this because it's not really well, it is scripted. A sketch comedy. The show that I could not miss an episode of for five years was Key and Peel uh, on Comedy Central. These guys were just brilliant, and they come out of a yeah. a style of comedy that's I think started with uh, improvisation at, um, yeah, yeah. at Upright Citizens Brigade, which I've been studying. Their their improv is really hard to do, but 
I, I could not watch an episode of that show without tears coming out of my face uh, because I was laughing so hard. It was, just, it was really, really good. And I, the last movie that I pitched for, I lost out to the guy that had directed all the key and peel. I was like, yeah, okay, well, great. Uh, so of course, he's fucking brilliant. Yeah, I, it made me feel better. I lost to somebody I really respect. Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, definitely. I was watching Kill and Peel. And, uh, I definitely loved the the, the, uh, the unicorn. The unicorn episode where the, the news people don't know what to do when they melt the whole uh, uh, unicorn thing and they go to the hood and everyone's like talking. Go, yeah, I saw that, that unicorn. Yeah, I have like wings and everything. I'm trying, racking my brains to think of a unicorn sketch, but I, I believe, like I said, you know, I, I, I can make glasses or something. Two or three times and I still don't remember. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know you Go ahead. Oh, so you mentioned you know you you you, you use music uh, the music uh, background to for for comedy. So when you for, so when you uh, are working on a project, especially editing, do you like I don't know you have like some uh, profession process or something where you play when you start listening a band or a song in particular to get the rhythm or it just come naturally. Uh, you're asking me about the editing process? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you know, what's happening on... on motorcycle? Um, what's happening on any, any show that I'm directing is the editor is cutting as I'm shooting. So, you know, uh, if I shoot the first day, he'll get those dailies. The next day, start sorting through them. By the end of the week, he's got a cut of that scene. When I come in three days or a week or two weeks after I finish shooting the, the, the show, he's got uh, what we call an editor's cut uh, or a rough assembly or something like that. There's different, yeah. different terms for it. Um, and then I'll sit down and I get my time to do a director's cut. So I always have material to start with. And um, you know, most times these days I work with really talented editors and they give me brilliant stuff. They give me things I hadn't thought of when I was shooting. Sometimes I have very specific, I tend to be very specific in the way that I shoot things. I like to uh, block out uh, a lot of camera and actor movements before I get on a set. And then I'll use them a half, half the time, two thirds of the time. If there's something, if the actors, if there's something that feels uh, unorganic, <laughs> inorganic about the scene to the actors, I'll throw it out and we'll start from scratch. But I like coming in with plans uh, because I like kind of planning the comedy. I like planning how I'm going to direct the audience's attention, how I'm going to make the jokes play, how I'm going to make the transitions between the scenes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when I get to the editing room, some of it is really the way I had seen it to begin with. Uh, some of it, a lot of it is just fine tuning. Uh, kind of discarding material that doesn't work that well, either because it wasn't quite there in the script. I didn't realize it properly, you know, which happens a lot. Um, something that I'll try to cut around it or, or cut it, you know, as get through it quickly and get to the, the, the funny stuff again. Uh, uh, so as far as the music goes, if I'm fortunate, the editor will have some ideas coming in with. Uh, a lot of times I'll get cuts with no music on them, uh, mm -hmm. and I will start uh, putting tracks on. If it's a pilot or a feature, then I have a lot of creative um, input as to what music I want put on. An episodic, not so much. It's very rare that I'll get a, an episodic song put on. I did it, the first network show that I ever did was for Ryan Murphy, who's a very famous, very talented writer and director now. Yeah. And he, his first show is a show called Popular. And I did, I think it was the ninth episode of Popular. And there was a scene where these crazy girls have a, uh, a Gwyneth Paltrow's personal shopper chained up in the basement of their high school. And they're trying on, they're opening all the, the things he's bought for Gwyneth Paltrow and it was a crazy show and trying it all on. <laughs> and I made a, a music video out of it and I sent it to a David Bowie film, uh, which was fashion. And Ryan liked it so much that he started doing music videos. In a bunch of episodes, he would do these little musical sequences. So they kept, they actually paid for David Bowie's fashion because they liked the song there that much. That happens to me about once out of every five episodes, maybe one out of 10 episodes. Um, 
But if I'm doing a movie like the uh, Beverly Hills Chihuahua, which I did, or yeah. Wizard of Waverly Place, I have a lot more say in the music. Um, so it's actually interesting, Beverly Hills Chihuahua, I really got into rock and espanol, that whole movement. Uh, and I was using a mana and some, some really great bands. Um, so I was very excited about that because I got really high quality bands. And uh, I'm sorry to say they weren't that expensive. Uh, I'm sorry to say it, it was good for me, but not so good for the bands. They should be making more money for the music. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll generally what I do is once I have the cut the way I want it, then I'll go back and start laying music. There are times where the music really informs the scene, particularly with a montage or a fast scene, like the fight scene that I had, that I mentioned on Still the King. Uh, I had a, a song in mind and I cut the fight scene to that song and the cuts were very beat specific. Because, you know, it's, again, it was action and comedy and the violence, the, the timing and the rhythm was really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that song didn't survive. They didn't. I was using a Dandy Warhol song. It's a band that I love, and yeah. they couldn't afford Dandy Warhols. Um, I forgot what song they replaced it with, but they, so they ended up using all the same shots that I had in, but they slightly recut it to the, the new song. And they did a great job. These guys are really good editors, the showrunners on that show. I was very happy. I was afraid to watch it because I knew they were going to have to. So I was like, oh god, I don't watch. Um, and that happens from time to time. I did a show. Um, I shouldn't say anything bad about any shows because inevitably the showrunner will see this on Facebook or something. You know, yeah. The hell with Spyro, fuck him. <laughs> I'll tell you the story anyway, because I love Greg Berlanti, but he hasn't hired me for all. So I did a show called Everwood, and the first episode they gave me it had um, uh, this subplot about a woman growing marijuana. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, Um, anyway, so I had scored it in my reggae. Gil Pulse or some Oswald, something I thought they could afford, not Bob Marley and Peter Tosh. And when I saw, you know, once I hand in my cut, I have four days to do a one hour cut. I hand in the director's cut. In TV, it's like I go on to the next thing once I hand my cut in. The producers do whatever they want to it, and the next time I see it, it's on television. So I got the producer's cut, the final on-air version of this episode, and I started watching it, and instead of the reggae music, which was very subtle and kind of just played in the background, it wasn't trying to be funny, but they were funny scenes, they had scored it with this cutesy pizzicato music. It was like, do, 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 which is like just hitting the audience over the head saying, hey, this is supposed to be a funny scene. You should be laughing now. And I was so depressed by it, I turned it off. I didn't watch that episode for about a year. That's how long it took me to like, okay, okay, God, I can watch it now, you know. I was just so hurt. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that that also, honestly, it hasn't helped my TV career that much because I get very caught up. I really take a lot of pride in my work. And I put a lot into TV episodes. I, each one is a, a baby to me. It's a short film. And I score it carefully, and I do very fine cutting, and I work in all the sound effects. And when producers make huge changes to it, it like cuts me. So that's I, I shouldn't I shouldn't even be admitting that. But um, anyway, it doesn't it doesn't bother me anymore. All yeah. producers who are looking at this want to hire me. I will. I'm there for you. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is okay by me. Just, <laughs> nice. So okay. So no. Um, you know, Graham is speaking over the script and everything. So, what tends to to, to to draw you to draw you into a certain project? Is it the script, the channel, like the channel network, or the, or the crew and the cast? I'm sorry, I I I am having a hard time understanding you. What drove me to become a filmmaker? Uh, no, what, what what brought you what brought you into a particular show? Is it the script? Uh, the, the characters or the, the network you're working on? You mean you're asking me how I choose what projects I want to do? Yes. Based on oh, what? That's a pretty easy question. If people offer me work, I generally say yes. <laughs> but I like working. Uh, when I'm not working, I do lots of gardening and cooking. I take care of my dogs and I, I make dinners for my wife, who's very hardworking. But I like to work. No. Uh, 
generally when people offer me episodic work, um, I, I if I have a hole in my schedule, I'm available, I'll say yes. There are some things that I passed on there. Uh, I don't love, you know, I've done some work for Disney Channel and um, I did two movies for Disney Channel and I really love those films. I'm very proud of them. One of them is called Wizards of Waverly Place, the movie, which won an Emmy Award for Outstanding Children's uh, Program. I'm very proud of that. I did another one called Minutemen that I'm also very proud of. That got a, a, I got a, my first uh, DGA nomination for that. So I really like them, but generally this, and I've also done two pilots for, for Disney Channel, so I should, I'm not going to say anything bad. Uh, they're great to work with. It's just that stuff that appeals to 12-year-olds is not as fun for me as edgy adult comedy. So I like things that have an edge to them, uh, things like Arrested Development and Weeds. That, that tone of comedy is very different than stuff that you're going to see on Disney Channel. So that's the first thing. I, I, if, the, if the material appeals to me, um, then I want to do it. If, I, if, if I'm reading the script and I'm laughing, then I want to direct it. So it's really about the script more than anything else. Perfect. So uh, uh, you know, you, have, you mentioned you have done some work on TV movies and you know, and actual films, you know, big screen films. Uh, the production process, uh, how likely or different does TV movies and actual and films tend to, tend to be? Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's not really that different. Um, uh, Everything is kind of on a, a continuum of how much money you have to, to direct something and to produce something. And the less money you have, the less time you have. Money really translates to time. So if I'm doing something on a very quick schedule, it's a lot harder than if I have more time to realize things. And for example, Still the King, which I'm very proud of, it's the first show I've ever been asked to do uh, comedy episodes in four days instead of five days. And I, in, you know, so I could have shot it in a very kind of uh, easy way. I mean, you still only have 11 and a half hour days, uh, 12 hour days if you include lunch, but it's really 11 and a half hours. Um, and because I really liked those scripts and the characters and I wanted it to look like a Coen Brothers film, I didn't want to cut the number of setups down. I just worked really, really hard, and I, I planned out all the shots ahead of time, so I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I tried to do very few takes. You know, as soon as I had something in the can, I would move on. We were moving very, very fast. I was, I did between 40 and 60 setups every day on that show, over 50 on like three of the four days, which was crazy. It's a, it's just an insane amount of work, and um, uh, it was really hard. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when I did Beverly Hills Chihuahua, I think I had, actually, that was really hard too because I had 26 days to shoot a movie, but it was all dogs. And dogs yeah. don't necessarily do what you want them to do on the first day. So <laughs> that's a goal. But everything kind of falls between, you know. Um, yeah. uh, actually, Wizards of Waverly Place, I had 30 days to make that. And it was a good reason. We had a lot of special <laughs> We shot that in Puerto Rico. We had a lot of locations go to um, but it was a lot more reasonable shooting a, a, a feature film in 30 days than it is trying to shoot a comedy episode in four days so you know, it's, it really comes down to how many pages per day they're asking you to shoot yeah. otherwise the production process is really not that different um, it's single camera television uh, no matter where you go you still have the camera crew and the assistant camera people and the grips and the electrics and makeup and hair and the sound department and um, it's really just a matter of manpower you know how many trucks you're lugging around with sometimes it's actually nice to have when you on a smaller budget you tend to be a more mobile unit you can get around more quickly if you have a very big uh, production crew with 60 people and you know, 12 times trucks takes a lot longer just to move two miles from this place to this place. You can only get away with one company move uh, a day. Uh, even that is is uh, a lot of stress. So sometimes if you have a smaller crew, a smaller unit, it's easier to be more mobile and get things done uh, more quickly and more efficiently. Um, but on the other hand, it's really nice to have money and time. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, uh, 
Okay, so the, do you when you watch uh, do you watch to do uh, do you watch the TV series that you have created or worked in, or do you prefer to move on creatively to the next project once again once you have wrap up that particular episode? Yeah, it's that. Uh, the the second thing you said. Uh, watching tell a lot of television for me is in English what we call a busman's holiday. Yeah, like yeah. if you drive a bus for a living, you don't want to get on a bus on your holiday. For me, watching a lot of comedy on television, it's really hard for me to get lost in it uh, and enjoy it without looking at it critically or feeling envious because uh, uh, either I think I, I could have done a better job than that person directing it or, or wow, he did a really good job and that pisses me off too. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm petty that way. Um, so the stuff that my wife and I like to watch together on television tend to be very big shows like Game of Thrones or, uh, God, we just watched Stranger Things. Have you seen that? It's amazing. It was so well shot. Um, and my buddy Sean Levy is the executive producer. I'm about to work with him on a single camera comedy that he directed the pilot for. He's executive producing called Imaginary Mary, starring Jenna Elfman. I'm going up to Vancouver in a couple weeks to direct that. And I'm the first director on after Sean, so that's exciting. Um, but again, my job is I'm going to look at the, the, the pilot that Sean shot again and look at the camera style and try to, uh, you know, emulate that and see because it's very successful. Sean's a brilliant director. He's a very big comedy guy. Um, and then try to bring something to the table of a, that, you know, maybe push it a little bit more in this direction or, you know, maybe I'll come up with a transition that they haven't done before. Did I? Uh, oh yeah, okay, sorry. Um, Geez, I forgot the question. Oh, oh, what do I watch on TV? Well, once once I direct something, I tend to uh, um, not keep watching it. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes my wife and I will watch an episode. Uh, she hasn't watched Orange Is the New Black, so I'm not going to ask her to watch three years of it to get up to my episode. So I'm just enjoying all my friends on Facebook are just like, wow, such a good episode. It's like, so I have to be content with that. It's a very strange thing being a TV director because you don't get to watch with your audience. If you do a movie, you can go sit in a theater and watch with an audience. And that's the most satisfying thing for me is to hear people react, especially with comedy. Just hearing people laugh at your work is amazing. It's doing, it's like being in theater which I used to do when I was much younger, you get this immediate feedback. Uh, or when I was a drummer, you know, you have an audience on the dance floor, you have a crowd on a dance floor dancing. Being a director is like, you know, you, you spend your life making something, you spend 18 months making a movie, or it's for, if it's on TV, it's like, well, uh, you have to like, you know, read reviews or my mom would call me and say, oh, I like that, that was nice. Like, okay, thanks, okay, next, next thing. <laughs> so it's nice to watch with an audience. But um, I, I don't tend to watch the shows that I work on. I, I watch other stuff that I don't work on. You still there? Uh-oh, you frozen. Oh, dear. Can you hear me? <laughs> hmm. Obviously a major malfunction. Um, if you can hear me, I'll, get, I'll turn, uh, I'm going to, Hang up and I'll try clicking back in. Ciao. Uh, okay, how do we get back? You're gonna have to edit this part out if you post this somewhere. Otherwise I have to, yes, yes. Hmm, I am turning it in. Should I hang up? Okay, then I'll, I'll just keep here. I'll stay right here and keep talking to myself. I'll, I'm going to look up an Oscar Wilde quote for you while I'm waiting for you to come back because he, he had something brilliant to say about uh, talking to oneself. 
Uh, next question, too. Out of all the series that he has worked on, which character would resemble him personally the most and why? Okay, you're going to write me questions now, huh? <laughs> Can you write yes really quick so I know that you're still there? Yes, okay. Um, what character do I resemble most and why? Oh, Jesus, I don't know. I've never been asked that question before. Uh, what character? I, I used to, people used to tell me that I looked like Jeff Goldblum a lot which is not that big a stretch because, you know, I'm an American Jew or a Jewish American. And uh, uh, I was working on a Jeff Goldblum impersonation for a while. So it's kind of like, he likes to take his time, think about stuff, and then say things really fast. So I got Jeff Goldblum. Then um, when Iron Man came out, uh, Robert Downey Jr. had weird facial hair like I've had for a really long time. And um, uh, people said I... That reminded them of Robert Downey Jr. I always thought that was, that was kind of a dissolute character because, uh, you know, in that film, he likes to drink and do drugs and chase after women, and he's kind of morally bankrupt. So I was like, oh, thanks, okay. <laughs> but he was terribly good looking. I, I assume that's what they meant. Uh, I don't remind myself of any characters on TV. I'm uh, unique. I remind myself of some dogs, I think. Uh, yeah. There are some dog characters that I like. Don't ask me to name one. Next question. Does he view commercial success as a complete validation of his work or does that not matter to him? Um, huh, well, here's how I view commercial, commercial success, quote unquote. People have been paying me to direct things since 1994. So I feel blessed by the fact that I've gotten to actually make a living directing. Um, that's a tough position to work your way into. And I spend a lot of time um, talking to students and talking to people coming into the industry and saying, look, this is how I started. Um, this is what you should expect. It's going to be difficult, but you can do it. The fact that I've actually been making a very nice living directing for the last uh, 20 years, I see that as, as a success. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not as successful as you know, the household names uh, who are huge film directors. I'm not, I'm not a successful film director. I have not broken into theatrical filmmaking. I've done eight features. They've all been on television or DVDs or cable. Um, so I know the format quite well. I would love, to, I've always wanted to do something for the bigger screen, but I've not yet had the opportunity, even though I've pitched for lots of things. So there's ways in which I'm not successful, um, but I've, directed a lot of famous TV shows and I've made a very good living and my wife and I live in a, a very nice house that we built for ourselves and we have happy, healthy dogs and we're still married after 20, oh shit, I should know this, 20, 21 years. Whew. She'll never watch this, it's okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so a commercial success for me is I've, I've made a living directing, which is what I love doing. I'm, I'm very fortunate in that. you have more questions. Question four, what would he dream of working on that is something different than what he has previously done? Uh, that's a very good question. I would love to take on a smart original film for theaters because there is something different when you're shooting something for the big screen. And the last comedy I shot, we thought was going to be on the big screen. It was very low budget. I had $3 million and they wrote this huge script that was called Blue Mountain State, The Rise of Thadland. Uh, there's about five sequences in it that I'm very proud of that I, I think turned out very, very funny. Uh, oh, I hear something. All right, I'm back. Yes, I hear you. And I see yeah. a keyboard. Anyway, I, what I would love to do is a great movie like um, The Hangover or uh, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, except for not really sci fi, but just a smart comedy. Um, Bridesmaids. These are these are brilliant, funny films that were really, really well directed. Um, so uh, yeah, that would be my kind of dream job. Cool. Well, I just see I come back. Sorry about that. Uh, the, so next question: Do you still have hopes or dream goals and a big and ambitions? You know, I liked it when you were typing them because I could understand everything really well. Do I have? I'm sorry. Dream goals or ambitions? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I kind of just answered that one. It was really, it was, I think it would be to, um, to, to move into features um, at my tender young age. But, you know, I, I, I really like my job. I'd like to keep directing for another 20 years or so. Um, so I, I want to keep getting hired and doing interesting things. Uh, last year, I got to do uh, two really interesting shows. The year before that, I got to do two really interesting shows. I got to do Unreal and this movie, Blue Mountain State. So uh, it's joyful for me getting to try to bring to fruition, getting to try to realize these scripts and, um, uh, and, and realize them and you know, make a film out of them, make a visual world out of them and make the comedy work on a, on a screen. Uh, it's incredibly satisfying for me. So I want to keep doing that for another 20 years. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, as, uh, as many of us know, you have won some awards and, be, and have been nominated uh, to Amy's and stuff like that. Uh, how does this, all, all these conditions have influenced you as a director? Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Can you, can you type that one out for me real quick? Or do we no longer have the, uh, the text link? Uh, oh, you've been nominated for several awards. Oh, uh, they um, they make me feel good about myself. I'm not I'm not grumpy. My dogs are happier because I play with them more. Hey, I got an Emmy nomination. You guys want to play? <laughs> um, then I spend less time being depressed that Donald Trump is only five points ahead of uh, behind in the polls, and it's like, why, why isn't he? 90 points behind in the polls. He's an orange idiot. He's a cheater with quasi-fascistic tendency. Mussolini on steroids. So, sorry. See, that's when I don't get Emmy nominations, I start fixating on actual problems in society. And when I get the nominations, I'm happy. It's like, yay! My no. Okay, let me give you a serious answer. It is very satisfying to have your work recognized by your peers in any form, by critics, by other directors, by writers. Um, so it doesn't, does it affect my work? No. I, maybe I just haven't gotten enough of them. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think to myself, oh, that got me an Emmy. I should do that more. Or you know, I, I don't think that. I, as you get older, as a filmmaker, not as you get older, but just, you know, as you live life, yeah. you have, influences constantly coming in. I read the papers every day. I read magazines. I read books. I see films. I travel. I love traveling. I was in Peru last summer. Is anybody here from Peru? Fantastic. <laughs> Lovely people. I was in Morocco the year before that. I'm going to Antarctica in December. Not many people there, but good penguins. Um, my, my point is you change the filmmaker based on every all of your input. Yeah. So that's what changes me. Uh, just my perceptions of the world and what I think is important and what I think is important to say in films and what I think is funny and, you know, that's what changed. The awards just... They make me happy and, like I said, they make my dogs happy. Cool. I'll say, so if you had a chance to interview someone, uh, what would you... Who will, who will it be, and what will you ask him? Perhaps, a, 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 perhaps as a personal inspiration or idol. Uh, usually, this question gets asked to me. They say, "Well, if you could interview anybody, dead or alive, who would it be?" And I, I like to say, "Well, I, I prefer living people. Um, the dead ones are di more difficult to talk to." Uh, yeah. Gee, who who would I want to to interview? Is that the question, mm -hmm. or, or who's an inspiration? Um, Who would like to interview? Interview. Okay. Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not a journalist. As so an interview is an interesting uh, verb to use. I think if the question came to me, who would I like to sit down and spend time with, and try to absorb everything that's in their brain? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I guess on the top of my list would be some of my my favorite film directors, uh, like the Coen Brothers. Uh, like, uh, oh, hang on a second. Um, uh, Steven Soderbergh is one of my favorites. Um, uh, Alfonso Cuaron, Christopher Nolan, Danny Boyle. Um, these are guys that I just, every, 
any any film that they make, I'm going to go see because they're always brilliant. Even if the story doesn't work, the filmmaking is brilliant. And yeah, I mean, I remember. I mean, that's just the current generation of filmmakers. I remember, you know, uh, going back another generation. You're talking about Coppola and Scorsese and Kubrick and Spielberg, and who's still making brilliant movies, and and uh, Woody Allen, who's still making movies. Um, I would love to spend time with these guys and pick their brains about what they do. They'd probably be bored shitless though. I don't think directors actually love talking that much about their process. You know, they like doing it. Um, but they're all, I, I, I haven't, I rarely meet directors that I think are not intelligent people. They're usually pretty smart, interesting people that have interesting viewpoints on society and what's going on around us. And, you know, that's part of the reason you pointed out that I have a degree in political science, which is true. The world fascinates me constantly. So um, <laughs> that wasn't a good sound. Um, still there? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> are you being attacked by by creatures? What, what, what is going on? With <laughs> Sorry, this notification is entering. Okay. Anyway, so yeah. I, I would I would pick some of these guys. Or, geez, you know who I'd love to sit down with? Barack Obama, because I think he is the best president of my lifetime. Yeah. I, I so admire and respect that man. Uh, so yeah, he'd be my first choice. Because I, uh, I like thinking about the world, yeah. Cool, well, uh, I think that was the last question. I would like to wrap up here. Things like actor, actor studio, live from actor studio. So we'd like to give up some final words for those listening. Final words for those listening? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm going to be in Buenos Aires in December. If any of you are listening from there, send me a, 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 a Facebook message and we'll go have lunch. I like meeting filmmakers from other countries. I was in Rio de Janeiro. Um, I probably said that really badly, but uh, my wife and I were there earlier uh, this year and I just, it's fascinating to me meeting people that do what I do in other countries. Um, what else? If you want to become a director, uh, the best thing to do is is make movies. Uh, go out and make short films. You'll learn by doing it. If you can afford to go to film school, that's great. Uh, that gives you like a safe environment to make movies in. It's not necessary, but it's good. Um, it's definitely uh, one way to go, and that's what I did. I had the opportunity to do that. Um, but uh, don't, don't, don't. Uh, <laughs> Don't give up on your dreams. Keep chasing them. Nice. Well, thanks again for staying, for talking with us here on the Premier Down. Hopefully, people will learn more about it, and people will learn more about the TV Direction World and more. And so, uh, are you? Can people find you on the social networks? Where can people find you? Yeah, people can find me on Facebook. They can send me a message on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter. Um, I guess I should tell you my Twitter name or something. I think it's just LL Spiro, L L S P I R O. Um, on Facebook, it's Lev L Spiro, L E V L S P I R O. Uh, I'm on Instagram too. I don't even know what it is on that, but yeah, yeah. You, can, you can find me on any of those things and we can communicate. Perfect. Well, thanks again. And well, thanks everyone for also listening and thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye.